Welcome one and all to another day, another show here at the Damage Board. I am John Idarola and very lucky to be joined once again on the program by Yasmin Leah Khan. Yes, how's it going? It's going very well down here in Texas. Happy to be back. Is it though? I don't know. We got some stories about we'll Texas. We'll talk about there. it. Yeah. <laughs> They're not doing too good, <laughs> but um but you guys do have a chance coming up next year to right at least one of your electoral wrongs and replace Ted Cruz. Now I know you're a longtime supporter of the senator, but <laughs> he is facing a tough challenge. How you feeling about that? No, I'm oh God, <laughs> you know, we have been burned so many times here in Texas, but we're always so filled with hope going into an electoral cycle. And we say, you know, we can do it. We can get these people out of office finally. And then a lot of times we come so close and it's just like every time the disappointment just gets more yeah. and more. So I am trying to manage my emotions. That's what I'll say about all of this. I'm still hopeful, well. but I am managing my emotions. We're gonna see, we're, we're gonna take a look at the evidence, see how everything is uh, doing. Um, I see in the chat, people are very excited to see you here. They are worried, uh, they wanna know whether your tires have melted. <laughs> uh, it is very hot, obviously, in Texas. It's not quite Arizona, I believe Arizona is yeah. currently on fire. Uh, but Texas also doing not too great. So I, look, I, we're gonna be- it, yeah. Well, I know, I know we'll talk about it later, but yeah, it is very unbearably hot here already. It is, it is. and uh, if it makes you feel better, it's uh, cooler than it will probably ever be again. That does so, not, that doesn't no? make me feel better at all. No, I got to get better at my good news. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, um, really we're gonna be, yes, we're going to be talking about Texas. We're also going to be talking about Ron DeSantis. We want to make sure that we get in some discussion of Ron DeSantis before there's no longer ever a reason to talk about him again, which feels like it could be any day now. So we're going to discuss, he's still technically running for president, I believe. We're going to look into that and discuss it. We've also got some pretty tough stories, including what appears to be an intentional hit and run on a group of migrant farm workers. Uh, we've got updates on the GOP debate, who is going to be there, who is not going to be there. And that's all in the first hour. We got a lot more coming up in the aftermath, including uh, Elon Musk having one of his toys taken away from him. Um, an update on the Hunter Biden investigation and is Taco Bell lying to you? Are they giving you false impressions of the beef and lettuce and sour cream that you believe to be your due? That's what a lawsuit is claiming and we're gonna take a look at the evidence. But along the way, please hit the like button, share the stream so that people know we're live, they can join in the conversation. And if you wanna send us any comments, tweets or super chats, we will not only respond to them, but we are once again locked and loaded with a $100 Blue Apron gift card ready to, we're just gonna hand it over to you. The metaphor falls apart at that point. We're gonna give you the Blue Apron gift card for a particularly good comment, so send them in. Anyway, with all that said, Yaz, you ready to do this thing? I'm ready, let's do it. Okay. And let's take a look at the state of Texas, starting with this. This morning, the humanitarian crisis in Texas is accelerating. Millions still without power or water. Hospitals around the state push to their brink, and the death toll is rising. Senator Ted Cruz made time for a family vacation in the middle of our state's historic winter storm. The images were everywhere today, showing the Texas senator with his family boarding that flight to Mexico. This is inexcusable, and Texas should be outraged. Woo, okay, well, that is an ad from the uh, Lose Cruz pack. And I'm sure they feel like that's a really good attack against Ted Cruz. But the issue is the heat wave that he was running from was like a year ago. Clearly, Texas is never gonna experience a heat wave like that again. So it's hardly gonna be a topical thing. Of course, Texas is baking right now with once again a lethal heat wave. And so being reminded that their senator just fled to go have fun, drink a pina colada, relax in the in the in the ocean, um, that might hurt him. Now we're so gonna remind you of a few I other elements of that. I just wanna correct one thing real quick, John. Uh, he in. actually fled during the polar vortex, so we were freezing in Texas, and that's sorry. When he I apologize. Fled to I have to yeah. remember that you guys are either in one of those two states at any particular time. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's, it's uh, fine. February 2021 winter storm is what he was fleeing then. Uh, soon, I'm sure he'll be fleeing uh, the heat as well. So, look, the the general issue is that Texas is not prepared for extremes of weather. Whether they come in the form of winter storms or they come in the form of heat waves, people die. 
and they will continue to die if that's what brings corporate profits. And since it does, and that's who pays politicians like Ted Cruz, he's not gonna do anything. And the fact that he fled, that he went to Cancun or whatever, that's like kind of like the spit in the eye. But what he doesn't do, which is push for any sort of regulation, any change, any evolution to the way Texas manages its power grid or helps those who are potentially vulnerable in times of heat or cold, that's the big issue. And that's why like it's it's a good ad visually. It makes him look callous and it makes him look like a joke and everything. But it's a reminder of an incredibly serious ongoing problem. I will say. You know, first of all, I feel like every time I come on one of these shows, you guys try to trigger me with like footage of Ted Cruz. So thank you for that. But <laughs> I will say there is some level of brilliance to the ad because if you talk to a lot of people who don't like Ted Cruz, that comes up. They call him, you know, he, what do they call him? Fled Cruz or something, right? Yeah, he fled, right? Cruise. It was like emotionally offensive to Texans that he did that. Of course, there's a bigger issue as to you know our whole power grid and how the oil and gas industry won't really let us fix it and how our governor is blaming all of the issues with our power grid on the windmills of all things. So there, there's actual issues that need to be discussed. But I think that thing about Ted Cruz fleeing to Cancun, it really does hit at the emotions of a lot of Texans. That was I don't think that I'm overselling it to say that it was like a traumatic event for a lot of people living in the state at the time. And I think people yeah. outside of Texas, outside of Texas, really they don't understand what it was like going through something like that. We are not equipped for cold weather. We're not prepared for it. We don't have the resources to deal with it. But something like what happened in February 2021 still should not have happened, right? We still yeah. should have been able to keep our heat on inside of our homes. And our government didn't really do a whole lot about it during or after the fact. And two years later, they still haven't really done a whole lot to fix the power grid. So it is an ongoing issue, it does need to be talked about. But the emotions are still, I think, you know, more fresh than I would even expect them to be. So that's a yeah. good thing. Yeah, and look, I understand it on a primal level. Like when when you think about most politicians, most politicians obviously are terrible and do nothing. But what's like the one thing they know they're supposed to do? When there's a disaster, you go there. You go there and you probably do nothing. You probably accomplish nothing. You, you know, walk through a flooded street or you stand on the beach when there's a hurricane. It doesn't necessarily accomplish much, but it at least tells the community that you're in it with them, that you feel their pain or at least are close to their pain. Yeah, he no, could Ted even couldn't even be that. bothered to do that much. He wouldn't do yeah. that, but you know, he did do stuff was better O'Rourke who at the time was, I don't, I don't I don't even think he held a public position at that point. And AOC came down here and she did more stuff than Ted Cruz did. And then Ted Cruz went to Florida and he made fun of all the Texans who were freezing. So yeah. he's just he's just the worst. And his dog's name is Snowflake and he left the dog at home. Oh my God, what a disaster. Yeah, I just- that's another one of those primal things that'll hit people. Now, that said, we're pointing out why I think a lot of people have a problem with this. If you don't recall, he did have a reason for going to Cancun. Take a look. Well, Texas is going through horrific storms, and millions of Texans have lost power and lost heat and have been hurt. And our, our family was among them. We had no heat and no power. And uh, yesterday, my daughter's asked. I agreed, so I flew down with them last night, uh, dropped them off here, and now I'm headed back to Texas. Yeah, I don't know that that necessarily helps. I mean, he acknowledged the storms are bad, which is true. That's good. That means that at least while he was in Cancun, he Googled what was going on. So that's nice. Um, but a reminder that what you fled was horrendous is also not great for you because, again, you fled it and you can't change that. And then to try to, like, you know, throw your throw your family under the winter storm or whatever. I don't think a lot of people are gonna love that too. All of this is just, it is like the perfect encapsulation of the issue people have with slimy politicians who don't give a damn what happens to their constituents.
Yeah, and he, he lied and he tried to blame it on his daughters, which is really, really low. Uh, and then the best part of this whole saga, John, was that we actually got leaked text messages from his wife's you know, friend group. So somebody in his wife's friend group is the one who leaked this to the media, which is my favorite part of this whole story. And they were the ones planning the trip, they wanted to go. And then he had the audacity to blame it on his daughters. Like what a, yeah. oh, he sucks, he's the worst. Yeah, I can only imagine after all of this, what other messages were going around in his wife's friends group <laughs> message. Uh, probably not positive stuff for him. In any event, reminder, if you live in Texas and you're disgusted by what you just saw, you don't have to see it for that much longer. You can boot his butt out of the seat. Bear in mind, a Democrat has not won a statewide race in Texas for three decades, but they are really trying to beat Ted Cruz in 2024. Representatives Colin Allred and State Senator Roland Gutierrez are currently running. And it is going to be difficult, but he is reprehensible. He's a possum faced loser, and I think a lot of people are getting that. And remember that the last time, back in 2018, how was this five years ago? It feels like it was yesterday. He beat Beto O'Rourke by like nothing so close. I mean, you know, it's a couple hundred thousand votes. You are gonna have to make that up, but I think it's possible. It's not gonna do itself. It is gonna require organizing, it's gonna require engagement. But just think about how delightful it would be to like wake up the next day and hear that Ted Cruz is not long for the Senate. That would be so great. What That's did I just what I tell you? You're trying yes. to emotionally manage, you know, so I, I really want to be hopeful, but you know, like like those election results from the race with Ted and Beto, I swear will just like haunt me in my dreams forever. It became so, so close. And I still will say we were successful in getting that close in the first place, just because this place is so red. You know, his historically, at least over the past 30 years or so. And every election cycle, it feels like it becomes more and more entrenched and more and more difficult to flip it to flip it back to blue. Because every time, it's like every time you turn around, the state run, which is run by Republicans, are always trying to implement different various methods of voter restriction, right? We're seeing it all the time. It's happening everywhere across the state. So we did, we made a lot of progress with Beto. I still think that people should celebrate what Beto did. I know he gets made fun of a lot, and you know, maybe some of it is earned, but I think he did do a lot of work. And hopefully, that's a good primer for whoever. It turns out to be who's gonna, I think it'll probably be Colin Allred. He's been spamming me all over the yeah. place. He has quite a significant um, campaign that he's running. Okay, well, uh, we're, we're gonna see. I, I hope that it's, you know, I hope if, if it's gonna be him, I hope it's well funded. I hope people get engaged. Um, I, I don't wanna get too excited. I know that it's really difficult, but, but like I think about how close it was in 2018, and I think of all of what has happened since then in Texas, like, you know, the stripping away of bodily autonomy, all the experience of the pandemic, the needless deaths that happened there, the weird culture war and the banning the books and the anti trans stuff. And, you know, Ted Cruz, what the hell has he done over the last five years? So I'm hoping that when you pile up all of that stuff, it's enough to give us the two extra percentage points or so that we need. Yeah, I think the messaging there is gonna have to be really important for the Democrats just to remind people of how bad it's gotten. Cuz I think over time people can kind of remember one thing here, one thing there, but it really doesn't feel as impactful as it did at the time that these things were being announced. So I think they're gonna have to keep reminding people how bad it is. And you know, they always say that Texas is a non-voting state. We have low voter turnout, so hopefully we can work on that as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I want everyone to remember too, like, you know, 2018 was just two years after Ted Cruz was the runner up for the Republican nomination in 2016. Mm -hmm. He was the guy that stuck around. That so he was like the second guy in 2016. Who the hell is he now? Like how does Ted Cruz matter now honestly in the Yeah, Republican he's been context? pretty quiet lately actually, yeah. especially for a guy who's coming yeah. up for re-election. And let's also bear in mind in 2018, he didn't have Donald Trump potentially inspiring a lot of democratic turnout. If Donald Trump is the candidate and he's as bad as we know he'll be, there's gonna be a lot of people turning out in Texas to vote against Trump. Just an idea. Anyway, I'm not ready to place bets or anything, but I'm excited, I'll say that. We can visualize and manifest it collectively. We'll do that. We'll work well, on that. Let's let's split the labor. I'll visualize you manifest. Okay. 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 
with that said, we're gonna turn now to something even worse for Texas. Here's a crazy little factoid about Texas. It has to do with how they treat humans and how they treat animals. In Texas, did you know that animal shelters are obligated by law to ensure that their ambient temperature does not rise above 85 degrees Fahrenheit for more than two hours. The basic idea being that that would be dangerous to the dogs and the cats and others and they don't want to put an animal through that. But there are some animals that are they're okay with that. And that would be animals like people, particularly prisoners, who largely across America are afforded basically no consideration or thought. But particularly in Texas, they're about the last thing that people are worried about. And that's a problem because it is really hot in Texas right now. And nowhere perhaps is it hotter in Texas than in prisons. Bear in mind, most of these prisons don't have cooling systems. Uh, up to 100,000 incarcerated people are currently baking in effectively concrete and metal cells that act as heat traps. Inside temperatures are estimated to rise regularly above 115 degrees Fahrenheit and have even been recorded to reach as high as 149 degrees Fahrenheit. That of course is not sustainable. That's That's like you can cook things at that temperature and we are cooking things. Those things are prisoners. Texas is one of at least 13 states that does not mandate universal prison air conditioning. About 70% of its units have just partial or no cooling systems whatsoever. And when you hear those temperatures like 115 degrees Fahrenheit, you might think, okay, well, I've sort of heard that like Arizona is experiencing those temperatures. Yeah, outside and people avoid it. There's no avoiding it, it's where you are as a prisoner, that's it. And if you're wondering, well, does this have an effect on them? Yeah, Uh, between 2001 and 2019, a team at Brown looked into the 2000 deaths that were recorded in uncooled Texas prisons during that time. And they concluded that 13%, some 271 deaths might be attributable to extreme heat. 271 people needlessly dead. Now I know in the modern context in America, we needlessly kill way more people than that. But that is still 271 people. And while you might have the reflex to think, well, they're prisoners. I don't need to afford them any compassion whatsoever. Uh, Not necessarily, like uh, just the fact somebody messed up or committed some sort of crime does not mean that they should be cooked alive in a concrete hell. Um, And so anyway, yes, this is happening all around your state, what say you? Yeah, I mean, it's so funny that you have to clarify that these are people and they don't deserve to die just because they did something wrong. Because I do think that that is kind of the knee jerk reaction of a lot of people. And here in Texas, we don't have the best record when it comes to our prisons and our prison system. We also don't have the best record when it comes to the humane treatment of people. You know, you look at what's happening in the prisons and then also down at the border. And there are people here, Republican voters, who defend all of these things. You know, it's one thing to say, you know what, I have an issue with this. I don't like that you committed this crime, whatever. It's another thing to say, I don't care if you burn alive in a prison cell under incredibly inhumane treatment, you know. I don't know how to get from point A to point B. In like in my own mind, in my own heart, I don't know how that happens. Living in Texas is frankly impossible at this point unless you have air conditioning in your car, in your home. The only way that we survive down here and I mean, yeah, like since I've moved here and now it's even hotter than when I first moved here. You go from your air conditioned house to your air conditioned car to your air conditioned office or wherever you're going, right? That's how it works. If you're subjecting yourself to these extreme temperatures for an extended period of time, it is exhausting. You will get a heat stroke. It will it'll literally knock you out. So it's it's really upsetting that people wouldn't find a problem with that just because these people committed a crime. Yeah, no, 100%. They should be more bothered by this, but but look, I've generally found over the last few years that advocating for any consideration for prisoners is considered some sort of like, no matter what the conditions are across the country, it's like a luxury, it's an extravagance that we can't that we can't bear and probably shouldn't even bother thinking about, like advocating for you know people who like not everybody who's in prison killed 30 people and ate their bodies. Like that's not actually how reality works. The idea that they should be denied the vote, that they should be denied the opportunity when they return to society to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I will never understand that, but 
Yeah, it's either. also very short sighted. Like, what do you think is going to happen with these people? Wouldn't you want them to reintegrate into society a better person than when they went in? So I don't really know what their end goal is or what they hope to happen or hope to see happen with these people. And also the fact that Texas doesn't mandate air conditioning in prisons is insane. But we also saw our governor, he recently said that you know employers don't need to mandate water breaks for workers, for mail yeah. delivery workers and things like that. So we are behind on a lot of things that we should really be ahead of. Yeah, I'm glad that you point that out because we do need to give credit where credit is due. And Greg Abbott is at least being consistent. He doesn't give a damn if prisoners or workers drop dead from the heat he's contributing to with his barbaric energy policy. So yeah. credit to you, Greg Abbott, you're the worst. Anyway, we're gonna take our first break. When we come back though, Ron DeSantis, who is still, and we're checking, we wanna make sure with updated information, still running for president. Oh, Look at you, go for it. Uh, was interviewed by Brett Baer. We're gonna have uh, some of that for you after this. Don't believe that former President Trump could win a general election against Joe Biden. I don't think so, because I think that there's too many voters who just aren't gonna vote for him going forward. I saw it in Florida in my reelection. You know, I won the first time by less than a percent, second time by 20. Why did people vote against me in 18 but then voted for me in 22? The number one reason they gave was because of Trump. Because in 18 they said that they were voting against Trump, voting against me to vote against Trump, even though they didn't know much about me. Okay, there's a lot there that's like utter nonsense. Like he's having so much trouble making the case that everybody loves you. Seems like a weird way to go. But I'm gonna give Ron DeSantis a little bit of credit. He is actually, in that clip at least, running against Trump by saying he can't win, I'll beat him. Like that's an actual argument for why they should choose you rather than Trump. Rather than spending all of your time just helping Trump play defense against the cases that he's facing. So that is something, he is acting like a person who actually plans to beat Trump. I don't think he's going to, it's going really horribly for him as we'll get into with the polls. but. Uh, yeah, as it is at least good to see him acting like a candidate for a second. And by the way, focusing like his attacks on Trump, who is terrible, rather than pretending that he can win this race just by like talking about how much he despises trans people or something. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I'll say that, especially because like the polling numbers are dismal for DeSantis, right? And it, like it, it's it's kind of funny to watch him talk about how he can beat Trump when like all the all the arrows point to no you can't. So I don't know if he's like just coming off as delusional, but like good effort, I guess you know. Mm-hmm. I'll never disparage anyone for trying. I'll say that. Yeah, well, for, uh, pursuing his dreams. That's well, you say that, but we're about to turn to him pursuing another one of his dreams, is which is to uh, utterly rewrite all of the worst excesses of American history. So here he is being asked about one example of that. We eliminated critical race theory a couple years ago. When we did that, the media lied and the left lied, saying you don't want to teach about African American history, equating political activism and CRT with black history he said no not only do in the bill it says you've got to do all these things teach about injustice teach about discrimination so these standards were born out of the fight against CRT cuz this is true history so to take something and demagogue it like that that's bad faith and here's the thing this was a public process these guys were going through it People could have raised objections. No one said anything about this. They were being lauded for the job that they did by people across the political spectrum. Now Harris comes in and parachutes. What Republicans should have done is push back against her, say you are operating in bad faith. These guys down in Florida, they didn't have an agenda. They were just trying to shoot straight. We know what the left does. Republicans, you cannot take that bait. You've got to fight back against these people. Yeah, he he wants you to believe that these people in that context is the Democrats. But we know what these people he's fighting against with his propagandistic effort to totally remake education in Florida. Everything that he said about the process was an utter lie. These are political hacks that he appointed. Uh, and they were they didn't involve actual scholars, which is why it's no surprise that what they have produced is a historic. Literally the first examples they gave of their new approach 
uh, to rewriting the history of slavery, implying that slaves gained skills. So I guess it was good that they were slaves. Uh, listed a bunch of people that had not been enslaved or that gained the skills long after they had been freed. These people clearly don't know or care about the historic figures that they're profiling. Now, he didn't bring those things up. He didn't seem to have a problem with it. And are you really gonna expect Brett Baer to fact check that? But um, the, the plan is ridiculous and him just continuing to say we're fighting against like ideology or propaganda while being a part of maybe the worst example on the state level of a nationwide right wing effort to propagandize to kids by stripping them of the ability to be exposed to any sort of perspective or life experience that the right has a problem with. And then filling their heads full of ahistoric right wing nonsense. Like we get what they're doing and them just continually saying they're doing the opposite is not gonna be convincing to parents. I think the whole thing with CRT is kind of shocking to me because it's so easy to prove that this is not something that's actually being taught in schools. CRT, we all know that it's something that's being taught in high level graduate programs, law schools, things like that. The average first grader isn't being exposed to critical race theory. And most of these people who don't want it in their schools can't even explain what it actually is, right? Some of them don't even understand that it has anything to do with race at all. They think it's about churning children. Um, uh, leading them into the LGBTQ community somehow. Uh, so that's how misinformed they are. And as far as DeSantis is concerned, he's totally okay with a misinformed public. And not only that, he seeks to further misinform them. And as someone who will always advocate for better education amongst everyone, it's really disheartening to see what's going on there. And a lot of the things that happened in Florida, especially with the book bans and things like that, it's a very small faction of people who are pushing those things forth. And a lot of them are DeSantis supporters, and that's really their only qualification for doing any of the kind of work that they're doing. And they're not very, um, they're not trying to hide it. They're not being uh, subtle about their their efforts there. So it, it's really sad. It's it's it, We're starting to see a little bit of that here in Texas as well. So I'm sorry to see that spreading, but hopefully we can get a handle on it before it gets even more out of control than it already is. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Look, this is being driven by some activists and some politicians who are utterly terrified of their kids realizing what has truly happened in American history. But much more importantly than that, they're utterly terrified of them taking a look at American history and then thinking, wait, what if history wasn't just like 10,000 years ago and then there's like a concrete wall between that and the experience we have today? What if there are reflections of that? What if what if there are some policies that might be continuations of that? What if there are some groups who are pushing the same sort of bigotry and systemic racism that we can learn about in history? They have no interest in kids learning about any of that. And the way that you educate a generation is not by having people who are more scared of books than anything else in the world shutting down libraries, pulling books, banning things, and then rewriting history as if it's some sort of like fascist mad libs. Like that's just that's not how you educate. And by the way, like they can convince some people because again, there are there are right wing parents who are they like they know the bigotries they have. They don't there's nothing they're more scared of than their kids becoming woke and then realizing that their parents might not live up to the standards they had for them. And so they'll do some of this like, you know, like pulling books and everything, but it is not lost on most people that if you're the one banning books, you're the one locking up librarians, you're the baddie in that situation. It doesn't take a very persuasive argument to get people to understand that. Yeah, I, I hope you're right there. You know, I it's funny to me because I think a lot of the people that you were referring to, you know, they tend to read one book over and over and over again, and they think that they can get all of life from that one book. And it's so crazy to me because even within that one book, there's disagreement on how you can interpret it. I mean, wars have been fought over that, but this, this yeah. is a book that people, you know, decide to live their life off of. Which, if that's what you want to do, that's right? your prerogative. But you know, at least you know. Take in some outside sources, you know, get some actual life experience and don't. There's so much to be experienced in this life and in this world and in this universe. And I can't imagine just limiting the scope of one's experience to one book. And then not only that, but saying nobody else should read anything else either. You know, yeah. this book is bad. This book that I probably haven't even read, I don't think anybody else should read it either. And we're seeing that that's also been happening. The people who are behind a lot of the book bans haven't even read the books that they're banning, you know. Yeah. You know it's very disappointing. 
I can imagine an ad. So they had the great ad of like, you know, the couple that's like they want to use a condom in bed or whatever. And then all of a sudden there's this old weirdo who's telling them it's illegal. I, you know what you have? You have like a tight shot following a kid who like walks into a library. And like a lot of us experience, he just feels a sense of like wonder and discovery and exploration. And then you follow him in and he sees a book and he goes to grab it. And then a weirdo takes it and is like, sorry, not allowed. And then he goes to another one, sorry, not allowed. Just demonstrate how much is being taken away from these kids that will not be able to have the experience that you or I had where you could just wander around and read things and learn and become curious. Yeah, you know, back in the 90s, that's what we used to do on the weekends. We would just go to the library. My dad used to take my brothers and I to the library and we would just run around and pick our books and whatever. And that was always so much fun. I think something that's missing from the conversation about around book banning in general, you can read a book and then at the end of it decide that you don't agree with what was in the book, right? Yeah. Reading a book is not an endorsement of the content within the book. Having a book on your bookshelf doesn't mean I endorse all of these ideas. But still by reading so many different things, at least you're learning how to think and how to analyze information and you know how to interpret your own feelings about it. And that's what a lot of these children are going to be missing out on. That's how you learn how to navigate this world. And I'm really concerned about future generations who really aren't going to have those skills. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's turn to one more topic that was brought up. He was asked about the incredibly homophobic ad that he didn't release, but that was released in support of him and he was defensive about. Take a look. Log cabin Republicans called it extreme, naive, dangerous, politically stupid. Why, why did you do that ad? And, and what do you say to people that you're subtracting, not adding to potential well, first of supporters? All, it, it, what they hit him on was injecting men into women's competitions, which he did with his beauty pageants. And then he's expressed support for allowing men to use women's locker rooms and bathrooms. So those are the two issues. I think those are totally legitimate. I don't believe in demeaning anybody. And we have not done that since since I've been governor. Um, you know, these, these things get shared or whatever. And look, I'm responsible for it, don't get me wrong. But the idea that like I was sitting there like, oh, share this video, no, it's a rapid response thing. But on those issues about injecting men into women's competitions, that's wrong. Uh, We've taken a strong stand with respect to women's athletics, protecting women's sports. We've also protected women's bathrooms and locker rooms. And at the end of the day, you know, we can't go down this road where there's 37 different genders. There's not true. There's two. Uh, and I do think we have a difference of opinion on that. Okay, so he's not interested in demeaning anyone except uh, oh millions of people, which he just did repeatedly during that. For his own personal political gain, he demeaned these people, which is uh, you know there's lots of bad ways to do it, but that seems like one of the most callous since it's you know just for your own gain. Uh, so there he misgenders every trans athlete or whatever. Um, he effectively has just denied that trans people exist, like which. Like if we could just pause for a second, I understand that we're we're so deep into this never-ending multifaceted war against the trans community. But like I, I don't even feel like a couple years ago that was what they were doing. I feel like that is such a radical escalation. To, to not just be like, uh, we're gonna we're gonna demonize you in a particular context, like bathrooms, we're gonna make you out to be predators, and we're gonna try to ban like deny your rights or whatever. But we're fundamentally gonna deny that you exist. We're gonna imply that instead you're insane. Millions upon millions of people are fundamentally insane. Oh, and they're still sexual predators. And that is his defense against claims that he's being exclusionary. To once again double down on the same attacks. He didn't distance himself from that ad. He reiterated all the points of that ad. He is still trying to make that central to his appeal. He thinks the way to take down Trump is to pretend that Trump is pro trans and that is so utterly disgusting. Yeah, I think the whole, you know, like the bathroom issues and the the sporting issues, I think it's all kind of a red herring. It's like a way to direct the conversation towards an actual issue that people can, like a tangible thing that people can get around and you know rally around in a sense. And in that way, they don't really have to talk about all the dehumanizing that they that they are actually doing. But that said, they are still doing that, right? They're still dehumanizing people. They're still denying somebody's. Um, Worldview and the way that they exist within the world and the way that they see the world and interact with it. 
And at the end of the day, people just want to live, right? They just want to live in a way that makes sense for them. And sometimes that evolves over time and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes this is just how people are and there's nothing wrong with that. The only issue that they have with it is that they have built a very, very staunch society, you know, a staunch set of rules and guidelines for a society. And so anything outside of that is wrong and is unwelcome, right? But the thing yeah. is, over time, the only thing that can really happen is that that community and those guidelines are gonna become more staunch and more restrictive and smaller and smaller and smaller. You will always find somebody outside of the norm that you're gonna to wanna to exclude. It's never gonna stop. It seems like a lot of work, honestly. It seems like a lot of effort to be that hateful and that exclusionary and that discriminatory, but that's the that's the path that they've chosen. Yeah. Well, it's you're right, it is a lot of work. It takes up so much of your time, attention, passion. And that is not lost on the people who are trying to inspire their base to waste all of their time, attention and passion on that. Because a person who is spending all of their time trying to you know, uh, utterly annihilate the trans community or ban every book that they've never read is probably not thinking that much about their wages or their retirement or whether social security will exist for them or whether they'll ever own a home or whether their kids will be able to go to college or whether a minor medical emergency will utterly bankrupt them and their family. Because they're so focused on the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And I know that we're not gonna get you know good follow-up questions or whatever, but I would have loved a follow-up question from Brett Baer to DeSantis about that. Like, oh, you know, that that's a good point about the bathrooms. It's a big distinguishing factor between you and Trump, except that it's not. Trump feels the exact same way now. Um, so exactly how are we going to make sure that the only the right sort of people go into the bathrooms? Are we gonna be paying people a salary to stand at the door and check everyone's genitals? Or is that just like a thing that we're gonna like have random people doing? Like if you're in a bathroom and you suspect someone, then you check their genitals against their will. If we do hire people, how much are we gonna pay? Is it gonna be like a salaried position or is it gig? work or something, exactly how are we gonna find out exactly what genitals everyone has before they're allowed to be in public? Utter perverts, every single one of them, genocidal perverts. Anyway, we're gonna take a break. We're gonna respond to some of your comments. And when we come back, oh dear God, the news is gonna get even worse somehow. But don't worry, we will be lighting it up, lightening it up in a little bit. We'll be back. Okay, everybody, we were talking about the difficulty in the, uh, the, the social break of having liked Mel Gibson and what movies you might miss out on. People are saying Chicken Run 2 is out soon, so that's great. And uh, people said Signs, I'm, I'm fine with ever seeing Signs again. I, I, I didn't see Signs, but it was it made quite a splash. Again, no pun intended when it first uh. came out. <laughs> Uh, it did. Oh, look oh, who's coming! Sorry, today. I don't. I don't know what's wrong with me today. I have too many puns in my head. But you just, you just have Mel Gibson related jokes for some reason. Maybe I, I've inherited his mush brain a little bit. I yeah. hope not. I, hope I not. really hope not. That'd be really, that'd be really sad, actually. Anyway, let's let's lock it up, everybody, because we got to talk about something deadly serious. Let's jump into it. A 68 year old man has now been identified as the person who apparently plowed his SUV into a group of six migrant farm workers who were standing outside of a Walmart. There had been a search for this individual after video was uncovered. Turns out it is Daniel Gonzalez who claims that he panicked and hit the gas. Well, as we said, video is available. So we're gonna play that for you and you can decide whether his argument makes sense or not. Okay, so you can see a bus that had dropped off uh, these farm workers. It's to the left, basically, of the bus. You can see the, the Gonzalez vehicle there turning, hitting the gas, running through a crowd of people, and then fleeing the scene. So, look, even trying to play devil's advocate here, I don't understand. When someone uses, I panicked and hit the gas, that's usually designed to mean I was scared of something. He was turning into a spot. I mean, if he's saying that he accidentally ran over people and then panicked and hit the gas and ran away, maybe. But that certainly looked like an optional thing. You have a crowd of people in front of you. There's no reason to continue past the 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 spot there. So. I don't know. He's it, gonna. It have also to make seems pieces. like a weird reflex, right? If you're driving and you panic, what do you do? You hit the brakes. You know who hits the gas? I don't know. It yeah, just seems a little unusual. Gas. 
Who yeah. would be primed to hit the gas when turning into a spot in a relatively open parking lot? In any event, I'll leave it to his lawyers to try to convince people of that. I want to focus on the victims. Six people were hit. They were treated at Atrium Health Lincoln and sustained a variety of different injuries. None appear, at least at this point, to be life threatening. And the victims had all been released as of Sunday. Their employer, Jeff Krotz of Knob Creek Farm in Lawndale, said the group are in the US on agricultural visas for seasonal farm staff. So again, this is the sort of work that generally, you know, not a lot of people want to do. It's an incredibly hot time to be doing this sort of work outside. And then on top of all of the difficulties in terms of the work filling this very necessary role in our society, then being constantly the target of violence. And I'll leave it to the trial to figure out if this is a good instance of this. It certainly doesn't look good based on the video. It looks like someone willingly running through a group. I can't read his mind, I can't say that that's what it is. But as of right now, he has been released from jail, that being Daniel Gonzalez. So we will see as they as they move forward in, um, you know, in, in the trial. Any other yeah. thoughts? Yeah, this is kind of like what we were talking about earlier. And I think that this theme is present in a lot of stories that we talk about on shows like this one. But it, there really is a flip that get a switch that gets flipped whenever you go from saying, you know what, I don't agree with this, but I'm now now I don't see you anymore as a human being, right? Now I don't yeah. think that you deserve the respect of a human being. And these people who do these jobs in this heat, it's so devastating. Even you see like construction workers on the side of the street, right? Regardless of their immigration status, whatever it is, they are hot. They are working hard. They're here in Texas. We also don't have any trees to shade our like a lot of our, our streets, especially out in the suburbs. They are hot and they're just like scrounging under you know whatever shade they can find. It's really hard to see sometimes, you know. Just that on its own, just seeing a person as a human being and full stop, just and stop there. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know why that's so hard for some people to do. And I think that that really is a, a switch that gets flipped in your brain at some point where you can no longer distinguish from your politics and humanity and just like seeing people as people. And that, that's a really, yeah. uh, that must be a, a tough bridge to cross. Yeah, and look, you, you point out the fact that there were trees and potentially shade, I suppose. It's hard to tell from that distance. So again, I, I'm, I'm not God and I'm not Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. I can't say definitively exactly what happened. I'm just saying what we saw and what it looks like. As of right now, I'm sure people are wondering what, what is happening with this guy. He has been, he's now cooperating with detectives. Uh, has received a fifty thousand dollar bond and uh, is is facing a charge of felony hit and run, which seems uh, quite accurate in this particular case. Uh, that said, just for context to what we were talking about earlier, uh, here is a re recent clip from Fox talking about migrants in New York. Sean, we must take care of our Americans first and foremost. We didn't ask for these people. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know who's paying for them to come here. And then once they reach the border, our nonprofit agencies, Catholic charities and others, ask them what city they want to go to. They need to go back to where they came from because they serve no purpose here. They have no negotiable skills. It's not yeah. going to help America. It's going to cost us money and destroy our cities. And by the way, the numbers in New York are nothing compared to border states like Texas, nothing. Uh, anyway, great report. They serve no purpose, they have no negotiable skills, they'll cost us money, goes to Sean Hannity. And I appreciate a good yes and for improv, but I feel like you could have pushed back a little bit against that Sean Hannity if you didn't agree with every syllable that came out of his mouth. These people serve no purpose. Like I thought when he said these people need to go back where they came from, that's usually the marker that you're not the good guy in the story. But it takes extra work to get to the point of these purple, these people serve no purpose. They literally, like if all you cared about was the jobs that, like in terms of like, I know that they think of people cross the border and then that's it, they're here, they're a drain in society for the rest of time. That's not at all how migrant work works. People cross the border and then go back and then come back. It's seasonal in many cases, working tons of jobs, very much having a variety of different roles beyond just the fact that they're human beings, particularly determined, hardworking human beings that like, 
How do I need to convince this guy that America is historically strengthened by desperate people who wants to come and work and contribute? That is the entire story of our civilization. And every single step of the way, there have been people like, yeah, but not these ones. And he receives no pushback. He is considered a hero on Fox News. Do you think that people like Sean Hannity, after they're done running these segments on Fox News, they go outside in New York City and go down to what the whole all cart? That's what they do. You know, Mm -hmm. this is all New York City of all places. You want to talk about immigrants and how we didn't, what's on the Statue of Liberty? That's the home of Ellis Island. That's where they go. My own family, when they immigrated from South America, that's where they went. My family, they were in Queens, they were in Manhattan, they were working in Manhattan. And then, you know, my brothers and I were born in Connecticut later. It doesn't make any sense. It's all fear mongering for the sake of fear mongering. And they know that the people who watch shows like Sean Hannity's program on Fox News aren't going to question anything because they don't know. They have no idea what goes on in places like New York City because they all live in these very rural areas in in America across the country, right? And I'm not saying there's not Republicans in other more urban parts of the country, but I'm saying the majority of their voters do come from more rural areas. And even the ones in the very, the a little bit more suburban areas, they stick to themselves, they stick to their communities. They don't really know a whole lot of what goes on in places like the city. Yeah. Actually, Jr. and I were talking about that one time, and he was saying, you know, when he was growing up in St. Louis, they they like never go into the city, you know. So I think it's really easy for programs like Sean Hannity's to focus on, you know, to demonize cities and what goes on there because they know yeah. that the majority of their audience has no idea. They'll just take them at their word. Yeah, they they get all of their news from Fox News, who just shows them three year old footage of a flame in a city or whatever, and that's mm-hmm. all they think it is. Yeah. Okay, well, we are rapidly running out of time this first hour, so we're gonna jump into our last story. We now have less than one month to go before we're really into the thick of this Republican presidential primary. The first debate is actually coming August 23rd, that's just weeks away. And we have a pretty good idea at this point of who is gonna be there, or at least who could be there. Seven candidates have now met the qualifications for a spot on the stage. The debate is gonna be taking place in Milwaukee. But that also means that about half of the Republicans who are currently running can't yet be there. And then you have one who insists still that he will not be there. Donald Trump bleated in the last day, let them debate so I can see who I might consider for vice president. Which is annoying on one level. Um, It's probably most annoying to people who like Carrie Lake who are like, wait, what are you talking about? You can't choose one of them. What am I living at Mar-a-Lago for? But anyway, um, there are standards uh, to qualify for the debate. Not like ethical standards or intellectual standards, but there's some fundraising standards um, and also polling. You need to poll at least 1% in three high quality national polls or a mix of national and early state polls. And you have to have a minimum of 40,000 donors with 200 or more in 20 different states. That means right now it could be Trump, even though it's not gonna be, he says. DeSantis, Haley, Ramaswamy, Christie, Scott, Doug Burgum, who I'm reading here is North Dakota's governor. I'm fairly sure I've never heard that name before. But that does mean that at this point, Mike Pence, Asa Hutchinson, Will Hurd, and Mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez have not yet been able to get a spot on the stage. And like we said, Trump might not be there. What are you expecting to come out of this first debate, Yaz, which is just a few weeks away? Who cares? Who's watching this Republican <laughs> debate? You know, like. We know that Trump doesn't have to be there, first of all, right? He's already polling way higher than anybody else in that field, way higher than DeSantis, way higher than Ramaswamy. So he doesn't need to be there. And like we already know his base doesn't actually care about what he says in the debates or what he doesn't say. What he doesn't say is he never offers any kind of actual policies or ideas on how to fix whatever issues he thinks there are. He doesn't ever offer any of that, right? And then the things that he does say are the same things that he's been saying for years on on his campaign trail and, and during his rallies while he was even the president. You know, he was still holding all these rallies. He has nothing new to say and he yeah. knows that. And his even like some of his supporters were saying, you know, he didn't really say anything new. Like it's the same old tired catchphrases that he kind of pedals out whenever he needs like a good a good visual of an audience cheering. So yeah. there's I'm not I have zero expectations of this. I who cares? 
Look, th- th- there's certainly some polling data to bear that out. It, there's there's a whole bunch of different polls of where he beats DeSantis that you would think would have been DeSantis' strong suit. But I want to jump to graphic four. This is amazing. In a head-to-head contest with DeSantis, Mr. Trump still received 22% among voters who believed he has committed serious federal crimes. A greater share than the 17% that Mr. DeSantis earned from the entire GOP electorate. Mm-hmm. So people who think, oh no, he committed serious crimes and I want him over to Santis. That is amazing. I don't know what you say on a debate stage to swing those people, but um, DeSantis is gonna have his chance. Anyway, that's all the time we have for the first hour of the show. More to come in the aftermath, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.